tempting to look at Divinity Original Sin and call it a throwback to the days of Baldur's Gate and Planescape Torment, a time that many roleplayers still look back on with much fondness. Original Sin may have the trappings of such a game, the isometric camera perspective, an adventuring party of four, magic spells and pubs to relax in, and all manner of RPG staples. But this game is very much its own, and a fantastic fantasy journey in its own right, full of tense turn-based battles, grand wizards, and clever spots of humor and self-deprecation. Blood runs red, nearly identical to a man's. The volume of the blood can cause quite a mess, as you can imagine, so we're careful to perform the sacrifice within our specialized chambers only. These chambers are designed not only to collect wayward fluids, but also to muffle any unsavory noises produced by defiant lost ones. Original Sin gets off to a slow start, which can prove a little frustrating in the early hours when you traipse about the first town, learning the ins and outs of the game's systems. The introductory dungeon and an array of tooltips teach you the basics, but there are still common genre conventions you must learn to live without, such as waypoints and automated crafting interfaces. This is your chance to explore, to test the waters, and to poke and prod at the game to discover what makes it tick. In the process, you discover that Original Sin forces you to confront the consequences of your actions, and does so in ways that most RPGs that boast meaningful decisions fail to match. You cannot take every loaf of bread from an inn, or open any door you please, lest your actions lead to disapproval from the homeowner, or even the wrath of nearby guards. Original Sin goes even further, however, to the point where you must consider every action. For instance, digging up a grave in front of a grieving widow causes her to attack you in her grief. This one simple action, should you not think it through, might lead to an innocent's death, and all for a measly bone as a reward. When this happened to me, I felt more guilty and more invested than I have felt in entire quest lines in other choice-driven role-playing games. And so you learn that every action has a reaction, that you must read recipe books and refer to those recipes later if you want to make a club out of a piece of wood and a handful of nails. You craft items by dropping and dragging objects onto each other directly in your interface window, or perhaps by dragging items onto a nearby furnace. The excitement of new and gorgeous places to explore is often matched by the joy of learning how to make something new and useful from a book, or just discovering a new recipe by experimenting in your inventory. You spend a lot of time in your inventory windows, which proves rather cumbersome after a while, but there's that special moment when you create a magical starfish by accident, and then you work to figure out what exactly you can do with a magical starfish. What a wonderful place this is to be, brimming with terrific characters that have heartbreaking and sometimes crazy stories to share. There's a skeleton who misses having a soul and you might convince him to replace his head. There's a statue that promises to show you how your journey ends and rolls the game's end credits if you ask to see your future. There are blizzards and dust storms to trudge through. There are spider worshippers and cultists and an otherworldly place to call home. Every discovery is a thrill. Depending on how you play, that might mean the thrill of working out how to solve the quest at hand. It might mean the thrill of talking your way out of conflict using Original Sin's cool rock-paper-scissors conversation system. Or it might mean the thrill of doing battle with necromancers that see through your attempts to charm your way out of a fight. Such battles are tense and thoughtful. Once you're engaged, time pauses and combatants enter battle stance. From here, your party members perform whatever actions you command of them until you use up their action points or end their turn. While you start with skills from specific classes of magic and melee and so forth, character progression is very flexible, and thus, there are plenty of ways to turn the tide of battle. The greatest interplay here is that between the elements. You can create a rainstorm and then cast lightning spells to zap and paralyze anyone standing in a puddle, including your comrades. Clouds of poison can be ignited and oil slicks can be set aflame. As you level up, you can earn talents that further alter combat, such as one that allows you to heal when standing in blood. Some battles are rather challenging, but pay careful attention to the elements and spend skill points smartly and you can overcome. I haven't mentioned a number of Original Sin's minor flaws. A few bugs, some fiddly micromanagement, switches that are hard to see, a clumsy stealth sequence, and so forth. 
but I also haven't mentioned so many of the game's wondrous surprises. Dungeons that spring new kinds of traps on you and have you once again reconsidering how you must think about traveling through this mysterious world. Great writing that fleshes out characters in a few sentences without turning them into one-note cliches. I can't describe it all here. All I can do is ask for your trust when I tell you that Divinity Original Sin is a special role-playing game, and playing it is to fall in love with RPGs all over again. Thank <laughs> you.